basically the, the problems I gave you are the ones where if you just walk through the hints, it basically I'm just saying, hey, here's a telescope, here's how it works, it's those problems. And you just kind of work through them, and if you get stuck, you can do the hints, and you should get through. And that's why I wanted to do chapter 25. It's good stuff, it's stuff you should know, but um, uh, it's for the most part, um, we're, we're not going to dive into it all that much. Now, today we are going to start um, waves, okay? Start the wave, all right, that thing. But anyway, which actually happens in a football stadium. I mean, that's like a little sine wave that goes through the football stadium. Um, and basically, what is a wave? Um, a wave is a way that we transfer energy from one point to another without moving any objects. If you think about it, nothing moves, but energy moves from one, just in a regular uh, the first waves that you ever saw were when you're a little kid or something and you dropped, dropped, a, dropped your little rubber ducky or something in the bathtub and the waves came out from it, all right? Or if you dropped a rock in a pond, you see the waves go out. But if you have a leaf on the pond, you drop a rock here, plunk, plunk wave happens. And you have a leaf over here. Does the leaf move besides going up and down? No. It just goes up and down. In other words, that's a, that is both a transverse and a longitudinal wave. One of the things we shortchange you a little bit with teaching physics here at UMKC, and most, mainly physics in most places, we don't do sound. Um, somehow, my chairman, Dr. Kruger, gets in his eight-week session, he uh, gets all his students through, uh, through chapters 1 through 14 in this book. I don't know how he does it, but in eight weeks he does it. But... Uh, I think the mean score is 23, though. But anyway, um, so, uh, no, it's not. It, no, they, they, do, they do fine. I don't know how I get them. But anyway, we, and those are longitudinal waves because, all right, think of a wave. Let's think of a wave, and I'll call up um, some slides here from Chapter 13. Think of a wave like a slinky, all right? There's one way to get the slinky to contract and go like this. Um, let's say Jake and I. He's in the. Um, he's got the other end of the. He's got the other end of the slinky, and we've got it straight. And I push it like this, and he's just kind of holding on to it. You would see it kind of compress, compress, compress like this, and go back to him. That's a longitudinal wave because the force I'm applying to it is going in the direction of the wave. All right. Now, let's say we've got a string or something that we're holding um, together, and I go like this. I start going like this, and he just holds it at his end. And what you'd get is a sine wave that's going like this. That's called a transverse wave. And that's the way light waves, which are electromagnetic waves, move about. They are transverse waves. Um, and what surfers use at the beach are both transverse, because they're going up and down, and they're moving this way, longitudinal waves, at the same time. Okay? So there's the difference in the kinds of waves. So let's just take a look at this chapter 13. I'm going to go through it really fast. We are going to try and get to a quiz today, and it's going to be over, um, I think with this, okay, waves, equations of motion. We did all this in um, last semester. Y'all remember this? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anyway, here we go. Wave motion. Wave motion. All right. Here we go. A wave pulse is a disturbance that propagates through a medium. It transfers energy without transferring matter. That's what I was trying to say. Uh, the energy is a combination of kinetic and potential energy. So as it's moving along, it's going, um, it's ready to do work in certain places, all right? And at certain times, it's completely um, kinetic energy or it can be completely uh, potential energy. So this is a good example of a transverse wave. It's going up and down. Notice, the thing on the string would be going across here, but the green, the green bone never moves. It just goes up and down. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't travel along the wave. But energy is traveling along that wave. That's why it's going like this, along that way. And it's got a velocity and everything else. And it's got a wavelength. And we'll look at all those here in a minute. Um, this is just kind of a review, getting you ready for chapter 24. We're going to jump from 13 to 24 here um, real quick. Here's what a wavelength is. It's either from crest the crest of the wave, so from this purple point here to the top here, that's, that's one wavelength, okay? And, um, or you can go from trough to trough right there, all right? And then hopefully the next thing will be a period. Nope, doesn't talk about it. 
Okay. Oh, there we go. The velocity of the wave. Velocity of the wave is lambda divided by t. Now, what is the period would be as it goes from zero to two pi? That's basically our our um, that's our our uh, time thing there. That's that would be how long does it take to go from zero to two pi of a good old sine wave there? That's what we're after. You've seen all these before. Velocity equals lambda times frequency um, of the wave, and the frequency. The frequency is how many times it goes from 0 to 2 pi. Um, how many times it goes from 0 to 2 pi in a second. It's basically what we're doing. So remember on your exam, you had that voltage thing where V equals V naught, which is the amplitude. That would be the height of the wave um, times the 2 pi F T thing. Okay, um, Whereas that would be the... Uh, Lost my train of thought there. Oh, well. I'll get it back. Okay, so here we are. Here's what I was trying to talk about. Direction of wave, um, particle motion. Here's the, here's the um, waves may be either transverse, displacement, perpendicular to direction of propagation. In other words, it's displacing this way. The particle is displacing up and down, but the, but the actual velocity is going perpendicular to it. Or is this what I was talking about if Jake and I were hanging on to a slinky and I pushed on it from down there, it would compress here, compression relaxation type thing. All right? And there's where it shows kind of the, the wave is both. All right, now here's, here's what we really needed to get to so that you can understand. That's what we needed to get to so you can understand um, the way light works. All right? Because basically by the end of this hour, well, the next, within the next 25 minutes, so now we're going to have to pull this off, within the next 25 minutes or 30 minutes, um, you're going to understand why bubbles, and I'm not talking about somebody who works at um, bazookas, but anyway, but, uh, <laughs> I'm talking about regular, sorry, I don't know, I don't know why that hit me. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, and some people are going, what's bazookas? Oh, I don't know. Go down Grand. You'll see it. Anyway, um, 15th of Grand, I think. But anyway, uh, not that I've been there since I was like 21. I think that was my, so it's been a while. I mean, it's been there forever. It has been there forever. Uh, oh, now I've lost you. Okay. Um, no, soap bubbles. That's what I was talking about. Why are soap bubbles, why do they have different colors? Okay, why do, sub, why do soap bubbles have different colors? And it's because of the interference of the different light waves, all right? Um, and our, like, well, yesterday we had, we had a pretty good rainfall, especially north of the river. I mean, it was really raining. Um, and it forms puddles, and on your driveway where you've got oil from your car that's dripped, you see those different colors in the oil. We're going to figure out why that, why, they're diff why the white light that's hitting it reflects back in different colors. And the reason is because of this. Um, what we're going to talk about is the principle of superposition. In other words, if I have two waves, here's the thing. How, how many of you have been water skiing before? How many of you water skied? Okay. All right. When you go water skiing, um, <laughs> all of a sudden, it's an a. what's that? Oh, it's an A? That, well, okay, if it's an A, that was, and let's make it relevant, that, will, that, was, that has a frequency of 440 hertz. But anyway, all right. Um, and that's the way they tune things. That's the way you got tuning forks. They get on the same frequency. All right. That's why when things are a little bit out of tune, it's very hard on the ear, depending on, and that's also culturally dependent because in um, China and Japan, we're used to half steps in the United States and in Western music half steps, but in China and Japan, I don't know about India so much, but in China and Japan, they use quarter steps. Actually, that's why some of their chords, some of the music that you hear on their stringed instruments sound kind of funny to us because they're in quarter steps. But anyway, sorry, culture, so we've learned about bazookas, we've learned about music in China, all right, but nothing about physics, all right. Um, but anyway, the law of superposition says this, if you've been water skiing, how many have been water skiing and you, and you fall, you finally get tired and you let go, or, or if you're like me, on about 
the first two tries you wipe out before you can get up and get going. Um, while you're sitting there, a boat goes by, all right? A boat goes by. What, what happens? You get caught in the wake of the boat, right? You, go, you bob up and down. What happens if two boats go by and their waves actually cause constructive, right? Scotty's got it. They cause constructive interference. That you go way up and down. Or if you're out of phase, if they're out of phase, it'll make the water nice and level. It's kind of weird. Okay? All right. So, um, so that's, that's, this was really the big slide that I was trying to get to because that's what describes constructive or destructive interference. We know that um, light waves go from the red to the violet, right? And they're, they're different wavelengths. So if those different wavelengths, if there's destructive interference that's happening with red through the green, then the only, thing you're gonna, the only color you're going to see coming out is blue type thing. All right? That's why you've got a blue sky outside, which is really kind of a cool part of chapter 24 if you read it. We're not going to go into it too much, but I will talk about why the sky is blue and why the sunset is red. Okay? Because like I've always said, Anything, all your science training, the number one thing is it makes you a good parent. So when your kids ask you, why is the sky blue? You can tell them all about destructive and constructive interference of wavelengths, and they'll shut up and never ask you a question again. Okay, <laughs> now, okay, so here's, here's what, here's what, here's when they combine. They're coming in, they combine, they get, dealt, they get twice as high as they were before. This is constructive interference, total constructive interference, total destructive interference is when they come in, here's the wake of the one boat, here's the wake of the other boat, and here's where you are, and it goes, eh, it just goes straight across, okay? And you're not getting bobbed up and down, but this one, you get bobbed up and down pretty good. All right, okay, so those are the wave properties. All right, now, we're also going to talk about today, um, because we're going to talk about thin film interference, which is, it's always a bugaboo to students, but I think I've got a way of teaching it so that it's, it's, almost, it's almost, no matter how bad the instruction was, you'll be able to solve the problem, all right? So, um, if you just follow these certain steps. So anyway, when, when, we, when we have a, a wave, this would be a transverse wave because this is making it go up, it's being made to go up and down um, back here. And so it's, the velocity's going this way, but the, Particles are moving up and down perpendicular to it, so it's transverse. If it's attached here, if it's attached here, when it's reflected, when it gets here and bounces back, what we have is at a fixed boundary, it's inverted, um, it's a reflected impulse, and so therefore it's inverted, and um, it comes back. So that would cause destru um, destructive uh, interference, all right? When it comes in, and it's free to move up and down. It's free to move up and, up and down. That's constructive interference. And different films act the same way. What I mean by films is like oil or some of you that um, are into photography or, or have binoculars or telescopes or things like that. They have non-reflective um, surfaces put on the lens of the glass. Very good non-reflective surfaces which causes destructive interference. So the maximum light is transmitted into your scene piece, into your um, camera, so you get um, good pictures and all that kind of stuff. All right, wave properties, that's about it, okay, on that. The, the rest of it is all stuff, um, we get into the whole sound thing. Standing waves and resonance, we probably should have gone over that stuff early. So now, we are ready for chapter 24. Okay, so I just wanted to get that initial thing of the waves taken in. I'm trying to see what that, here's a beach somewhere. Okay, I don't know where. Could be anywhere. If we're looking from this, if we're looking at it from the south, if this picture's taken from the south, we're on the west coast. If it's taken from the north, we're on the east coast, right? Wouldn't that be right? Yeah. yeah. So I don't know where we are. Could be anywhere. Or we could be in the Gulf of Mexico on the east end. Okay. All right. Okay. Young's double slit experiment. Here we go. Now then, all the stuff you did in chapter 23, where 1 over F equals 1 over DO plus 1 over DI, all that kind of stuff, 
that was good old Newtonian type physics. Okay, that was good old. Hey, light is must be a particle. Okay, it must act like a wave, or it, it, not a wave, but we treated it like a particle. In other words, it's going to go through here, and when it and when it um, goes through the lens, it's going to bend a little bit, and all that Snell's law. It's slowing down, just like these physical waves slow down that are made up of particles slow down. However, back in about the 1800s here, um, I've got it written down. I, I meant to write down when Young did this experiment. Um, is See, Newton was doing his work about 1620. This was about 100 years later, I think. Okay, um, Kind of during Newton's, Galileo started the Enlightenment, and these guys are like right in the smack dab in the middle of it. But anyway, what, we, what he found out was, and when we get to quantum, we get into some real cool stuff with the way the duality of small particles. All right? But what Young found out was, now, if light, now what we're doing here is we're doing a light source. Now this is monochromatic light, which means it's of one wavelength. Okay, like it's a yellow light, it's a green light of a certain wavelength, or red light, or whatever. It's got to be monochromatic. If you shine a, um, if you shine a white light, we'll get into that, like just a regular flashlight or something like this, um, you get a different pattern. But anyway, what, um, what Young found out was, he was like, if, if things just follow, if they were particles, and a particle shot through here, and all of a sudden encountered this thing right here, what would it do? It would just stop, right? Nothing would happen to it. All right, and in other words, the screen over here would be dark, right? Well, he shot this monochromatic light through here, and what he noticed was, oh, it fans out. Just like if all of a sudden, this room filled with water, okay? Let's just take this as an example. And I opened this door, okay? And I opened this door, and we were on a slant, too, all right? This room, all right, let's say we're like knee-deep in water here. And I opened this door, all right? What's going to happen as the water rushes out to the floor? Is it just going to go straight across? No, it's going to, it's going to diffract out, right? It's going to, that's called diffraction. It's going to spread out, okay? And light spreads out, so therefore it acts like a wave, okay? Sound waves are really long and spread out, and they're also longitudinal. In other words, I'm, I'm banging off the, uh, um, we're, we're, we're compressing and decompressing the air molecules, and that's what gets sound waves to work. And so they're very long and, 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 and goopy type waves. So, so they can actually go around the door because they've got a huge diffraction gradient to them. Light waves, very, very small, very dinky angle diffraction waves. So that's why I can't see around a corner, all right? Because my reflection doesn't, my, my light waves don't diffract around the corner so you can see me. That'd be a weird universe. We'd let, I mean, just be different. We'd have to get used to it if all of a sudden we could do that. We could see people coming from around the corner, all right? I think mothers can do it when sons are doing something bad, but other than that, nobody else can. All right, now, so that's what we're talking about. So these things, so in Young's double slit experiment, what happened was we got all these bright bands, bright, dark, bright, dark bands on the screen, and it should have been... What should have happened was, all right, if they diffract out just a little bit, we should have, in other words, just gotten all a bright band here and all a bright band here or something. But that's not what happens. It, it breaks up because of destructive and constructive interference. Notice, um, at, well, where these are coming in right here, where they're destructive, in other words, they've got, where there are maximums, notice, where there are maximums is where the two waves, this wave coming from here and this wave coming from here, where they add up, they're nice constructive waves. See where they intersect? They're intersecting, so they're, they're the two waves intersecting. All right, so they're going way up high. Causes a nice big white band. But when they're, when they're at a maximum distance apart like they are here, they cause a dark band, okay? And, of course, there's a mathematical way to figure that out. Oh. And the different bands have integral numbers, in other words, integers, 0, 1, 2, 3 assigned to them, all right? 
distance out from the screen, the double slit, and we have a way of messing with them. Now this all gets kind of, eh, kind of screwy, but anyway, you've got um, destructive, I've already kind of explained what was going on, other, what's happening here. Um, there's geometrical reasons why it goes on, and if you really want to get into this, you can take our optics class next fall. You're, you're ready for it. You can take the optics class if you want, and they explain. Yes? What makes B a destructive interference? Because they're out of phase with each other. See how where this one's all the way up? All the way up, this one's all the way down. So they're out of phase, and so they hit here, boom, and they level it out so it's dark. All right? This one's constructive interference. See where this one's up? This one's up. Up, up. It looks like they're up and down there, but when they both hit here, they're, they're in concert with each other. All right. So that gives us a bright spot. So here you go. So that distance L, that extra, this extra distance L that this light wave travels is equal to N times... Um, Lambda, where n is equal to either 1, 2, or 3. Okay? I've always used m, but for some reason they're using n here. Okay, so anyway, the condition for the location of an interference maximum, all right, so, so if you're given a problem, and, and we'll do one here in a minute, um, where it says, okay, is equal to d sine of the angle equals n times lambda, which lambda is the wavelength. Okay? Here n is called, so in other words, here would be a typical problem. Here would be, write this down, because this would be a typical problem you'd see on a test and you'd need to know how to kind of do this. Alright? I've got to name all these things here for you, because I know it seems, this seems screwy, because what's this n123? Alright, I'll show you what n123 are real quick, because I didn't do that very good last time. Here you go. Here's where, here's like, here's the zero part right across from the screen. That's n0. One, two. That's what they're talking about. Now, a typical test question that you'd get, because we don't have, you know, this isn't an optics, optics class. You're just kind of getting a general overview of the whole thing. Would be, first of all, what do you think D is? Distance, distance from what? Of what? Yeah. What? So from crest to crest. Nope. 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 Let's go back here. Here's D. Here's D. It's the distance between the two slits. Okay? All right? It's distance between the two slits. That, sorry, that reminded me of a terrible joke. When you're going... When you're walking along a wharf and you're counting the cracks between the boards and then you fall into the water when you get to the end, what happened? When you're out of slits, you're out of pier. Anyway, so, sorry. Um, Y'all don't even remember the old joke, the old commercial, when you're out of slits, you're out of beer? Haven't you ever heard that? No. Sorry. That's... Whoa! All right, Tingy, make sure you erase that last two minutes before you turn that in. Um, all right. So here we go. So now what's D? Distance between the slits, right? And the, and the angle, and the angle that, that that is making, in other words, what we do, here's how we, here's how we do this angle. Here's our angle theta. We pretend like we just, due to the geometry of the way optics work, what we do is, and there's a, and, and if you take, the optics class, you'll prove all this stuff. But anyway, um, and it's very satisfying to do. Um, but we're not going to do it here. Uh, but anyway, if you take if you if you take this thing and just superimpose this thing over to here, to the center of how it, this is a this is a maximum somewhere. All right, this is the center maximum here. In other words, they're just taking that angle for that maximum. So let me show you again, back here. Here's a better way of looking at it. In other words, if I wanted to find the angle, we're talking about the angle that this, that this in, where n equals 2, that's the angle I'm talking about from this, that this line makes with the center part. That's what they mean by that angle theta. 
Okay? So a typical question that you'd get would be, what is the angle, let's say for a green monochromatic light of 660 nanometers, so 660 man nanometers is which variable up here? Which one is it? 660 is between D, theta, N, or lambda, which one is it? Lambda, okay. So for lambda, and it's going to the second order maximum. So what number, so second order maximum means what? N equals 2, very good. Um, and the distance between the slits is 10 to the negative fourth meters, all right? So what would that be? Well, that would be D. Then could you find the angle that that was making? Yeah. All right, then the other thing that you would need to do is you might be asked, let me just write it down. You might be asked to find, you might be asked to find what's the distance y here. So if you found this angle, if you found this angle and you knew the distance from the screen, would you be able to find y? Well, what would you use? If you knew theta. What would you use? What function? Tangent function, right. You'd use the tangent function to find theta, because you'd to find y. Now, they say because, because theta is so small that the sine of theta and the tangent of theta are almost equal to each other. And you can verify that on your calculator if you want to. You can take like, take like the sine uh, in degrees, take like the sine of 1.3 and the tangent of 1.3, and you're going to get the same number, okay? They're approximately about the same when theta is really small. So that's why their formula here for y is basically, for y is basically the tangent formula for when you solve for theta. So let's do that. Let's just do that so you can see, you see an example of this. And also if I stretch this long enough, then the second half of the lecture I prepared, I don't have to prepare it on Friday, and we can just come in on Friday. Because I know about, t how many of you have an orgo test on Friday? Losers. Okay, <laughs> anyway, so I probably won't see you on Friday, will I? N nope, nope. Because as soon as you're done with the orgo test, we're at Pizza 51 with a pitcher. All right, I got it. Okay, now. Tomfoolery, whatever. I can't afford tomfooleries. I go to the pier with my Schlitz, but anyway. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Now then, let's do this problem. Let's do this problem. Um, a screen is, uh, let's say, Let's just do this. A screen is, did I bring my calculator? No. Damn it. A screen is 1.5, sorry. A screen is 1.5 meters away uh, from a double slit experiment where we do a double slit and um, away from a double slit, which is D equals, oh, let's say 1.0. Uh, oh, let's make it this way. 5.0 times 10 to the negative 4 millimeters, okay? So we're going to make that really small. And, and we're, we're going to talk about on Friday, and maybe I might wait till Monday, this is also getting us to what, why DVDs and CD players work. Nobody uses a CD anymore, do they? I think I'm the only one who has, still uses CDs. But anyway, basically what it is, it's a, it's a um, for the different, for every piece of information that's encoded, encoded on the back of there, it, it's got a little bump out, and so different laser links are pinging off that thing, and it's measuring by the diffraction, by the, uh, by the interference. It's saying whether it's light or dark. That's why it's a laser beam. If it's destructive interference, it gives a zero. If it's constructive interference, it gives a one. So all those ones and zeros are your different codes for the different sounds that are going in there for good old digital stuff, and so that's how they work. It's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing stuff. But anyway, um, so we're going to do a problem here. It's going to take us five minutes to do, and that's doing that same, this same problem at about, oh, 339 times a second or something like that. Anyway, all right. So a double slit. Um, all right. And, oh, we're going to look at, uh, let's say, green light. 
I'm guessing green light is about 660 nanometers. All right, now, first of all, 660 nanometers. All right, first of all, this problem is very annoying. Why? I got three different units up here for distance. I've got to get them all in concert with each other. Um, what I want to do is I want to find theta. And, oh, I want to find theta. I'm missing some other information here. I want to find um, the third order maximum. So that's what you'd have to look for. At third order, at the third order maximum, at the third order maximum, find theta. Okay? All right. Okay. All right. So here we go. Third order maximum. Oh, first of all, first of all, this third order maximum, it's constructive interference. It's constructive interference. So we do this. We go I M equals, or we go uh, D sine theta equals M times lambda. Now, I know in the slide and in your book it says N, but then right in the very next section, it's, I'm actually going to write the book and say you guys got to get, you have to uh, get uniform on the way you label things because they're using it for N in section 24.1, but 24.2, they jump right into M, which is normally what we use in optics. So it's like, all right. But anyway, so we've got this. So third order maximum, what's, what does M equal? What's M equal? Three. M equals three. Lambda equals 660 nanometers. Okay. And D is uh, 5 point uh, O times 10 to the negative fourth uh, millimeters. Um, wow, that's pretty small. I meant to make that meters. Let's make that meters. There, that makes more sense. That was, that was way too small. That was almost a nanometer slit there. Don't need that. Okay, now. Okay, let's figure out what, what that is. So, here's what we do. We go um, the inverse. Oh, let me do it this way. Sine theta then equals 3 times 660 times 10 to the negative 9 meters divided by... Um, 5.0 times 10 to the negative fourth meters. And what does that come out to be? I have no idea. But theta would equal the inverse sine of all that stuff of 3, 660 times 10 to the negative 9 meters. Theta equals what? Point twenty-three. Is that in degrees or in radians? It, yeah, it's probably not very big. Point two three. It's a pretty small angle. Theta equals point two three. Now, the next question that you would have to answer on the it, this would be one question on the exam and or on your whatever your little quiz that you're going to take on the last day is. On, on our final day, because um, you're, you're going to get one like this. And then it's going to say, I, how, how, um, what's the y distance? In other words, the third order maximum is coming out at this whopping angle of 0.23 meters. This is 1.5 meters. What is y? Where is that hitting on the screen from the center, from the, from the, from the center of the uh, first center maximum is what they call it. What is y equal? How did we find y? Right, right. Y equals 1.5 times the inverse tangent. No, not the inverse tangent. Y over 1.5, I'm sorry, equals the tangent of 0.23, which also the tangent of 0.23, guess what that equals? 0.23, really. 
So y equals 1.5 times the tangent of 0.23. I think um, one of the homework assignments I gave you is just like that. Just like it. You might have to do it for a couple wave, different wavelengths. Or it'll say, what's the different angles for the different wavelengths? Piece of cake. Okay? You'll be fine. All right. Now. Okay. Uh-oh. Okay. Oh, I'm just trying to find out what this distance y is here. And I know this angle. Oh, 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 why? Because I don't like that. I've never seen that equation before in my life until I was going, until I was reading your book. This is what I've always seen. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. In, in other words, if I take L, because they're taking that in theta stuff, they're, oh, basically they're saying, they're doing all this stuff, right? They're saying the sine of theta is equal to the tangent of theta. So they're saying that all of this is equal to this anyway. That's what they're doing in your book. Uh, Jordan brought up a good question. She goes, why are you using this tangent thing? It's because it's the way I was taught it. And it's the way I've taught it for a long time. And then all of a sudden this book kind of changed. But basically what your book is doing is it's saying, since this is so small, this actually equals this. Okay? And so, and so basically what they're doing is they're taking that, here's your L, right? And then they're saying it's M lambda divided by D, right? Isn't that what they say in your, in your book? Yep, there it is. They're just saying, take this, stick it down here for that. Right. 1.5 is your L. Okay. There you go. There you go. All right, good. Good. All right, now, real quick, I know we're towards the end here. Yep, I accidentally hit that. Okay. All right, now, what we're going to, where we're going to start on Friday for the eight of you that show up, okay, anyway, is we're going to talk about constructive interference when, when, between different surfaces. That's why we get different pictures, or different colors. But before you go, one last thing I want to tell you all. I didn't get around to the quiz, so I guess we'll do it on Monday, because I'm not going to give it on Friday when only eight of you showing up. First of all, quiz seven does not exist, okay? So if you've checked your Blackboard degree and you're going, wait a minute, I haven't missed a class, and there's like quiz one through six is there, then quiz eight. Yeah, I don't know what happened to quiz seven. I just, I just labeled when you went and came and saw my friend Mike Kelly do the thing, I gave you 10 points on the quiz eight. All right, so now, um, so yeah, you can come back, but, but the last thing is soap bubbles, you've noticed on soap bubbles, they're really colorful down at the bottom and they're less colorful on top. And I didn't know this until I was reading your book. I should make you go look it up yourself, but anyway, I want to tell you about it because I thought it was cool. The reason that is, is because they get thicker. Why, why would they get be thicker at the bottom? Why would a soap bubble be thicker at the bottom than it is at the top? Gravity, exactly. Duh, I didn't even think of that. But anyway, due to gravity, the, the soap bubbles get thicker at the bottom, so there's more different kinds of constructive interference taking place, so you got different colors. All right, other than that, there you go. I'll see you all later.